Hello, hello. Okay. It's looking like we have quorum, so let's get started. Uh, good evening and good afternoon to anyone joining us today. On behalf of the IDDSI, I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled, The More We Know, The More We Grow, A Pediatric Hospital's Developmental Progression um, in, with the IDDSI. Uh, this webinar is being presented in partnership with our colleagues from the Connecticut Children's Medical Center. And we would like to thank you, all the listeners for being here and joining us today and spending the next hour with us exploring the process of IDDSI implementation. Uh, we would also like to thank our very generous sponsors who allow the work of IDDSI to continue. If you are interested in finding out uh, more about our sponsors, you can do so on our website, IDDSI.org. Now, some housekeeping before we begin. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website at the end of the week. Second, all participants who are joining us today are doing so in a listen-only mode. And this means that the panelists will not hear you or see you, and your microphone and your video will remain off for the duration of the session. Um, however, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit those while the presentation is happening. And to do so, you just have to click on the Q&A button on the middle of your menu bar at the bottom of your screen, and that'll submit them That'll submit your question to the panelists. Uh, they will address these questions as they see fit, either throughout the presentation or at the end, when we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for a Q&A period. Um, now, in the upcoming days, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to anyone attending this session via a computer. And I can see from this list uh, that there's a couple people joining us uh, through a phone line. So if that is you, uh, please send us a quick email to let us know who you are so we can identify you and email you your certificate of attendance. I think that's all the housekeeping that I have. So now moving on to our panelists for this session. On the call today, we have a wonderful and very passionate group of dysphagia professionals from the Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Uh, we have Virginia Van Epps, Marnie Simon, Jody Sajelka, and Cami Sylvester. Also joining us are Peter Lamb and Juvenstein, uh, Jan Duvestein from the IDDSI Board of Directors, who will be listening in and answering any particular questions about the IDDSI framework and implementation during the Q&A session. All right, so without further ado, I will, now, I will now hand it over to Virginia and her team to get the presentation started. Go ahead. Good evening, everybody. We just want to thank you for joining us, and we want to thank you, thank, give the IDDSI a big thanks for inviting us um, to do this webinar. We're very excited to be here. My name is Cami Sylvester, and I've worked at Connecticut Children's Medical Center for the past five years. And my name is Jody Sigalka, and I've been working at Connecticut Children's um, since June of 2016, where I completed my clinical fellowship here. My name is Marnie Simon, and I've been here at Connecticut Children's for, wow, almost 15 years now. Uh, I was fortunate enough to also um, serve as the prospectives editor for a while with ASHA, and uh, I have gotten my BCS um, back in 2012. And I'm Virginia Van Epps. I'm the clinical manager for speech. I've been at Connecticut Children's for nine years. I was previously at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital and Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. I am um, not only a speech pathologist, but also a certified lactation counselor. And I'm very proud to work with an amazing team here at Connecticut Children's across four sites. And uh, we have a great cadre of 20 speech pathologists on staff. The next slide shows our disclosures, which basically explain that we each receive a salary from Connecticut Children's and we have no other relationships to disclose. Connecticut Children's Medical Center is a 187-bed freestanding children's hospital with services throughout the state of Connecticut. We're a primary pediatric teaching hospital for the University of Connecticut Medical School. We have approximately 1,100 medical staff in over 30 specialties. 
We have a level four NICU at Harford Hospital and level three NICU at our Yukon Center. We have additional NICUs throughout the state coming under our direction this summer. The speech department has 20 SLPs across locations with three primary outpatient sites and inpatient coverage provided at our main campus and in our current NICUs. And the speech department provided over 20,000 visits in 2017. And so as you can see, um, we're a very diverse staff and we're really fortunate and we focus primarily on pediatrics. And so how did we come into um, using the IDVSI? And what it came down to is we have a really committed SLP staff that works really closely with a lot of our medical colleagues in GI and ENT. And we were constantly trying to find ways to better serve our children who have dysphagia. And part of what we were finding is that even though we were trying to do our best to um, provide children with a care based on the standards we had at the time, a lot of our medical um, a lot of our medical colleagues were coming back to us and saying, okay, well, we did this thick and liquid thing and this kid is still getting sick, or the parent is reporting that we're now having problems since you've um, implemented this new diet. And we were also noticing that we we're having problems uh, being able to educate caregivers on how to prepare meals for their children and how to make sure that they were able to provide the right thing for their child across every meal that they gave. So we were looking out and trying to see what we could do to make it better. And so what we did before the IDDSI was pretty similar to a lot of other um, facilities in the area and uh, several of the other pediatric facilities that I had reached out to. And we were using kind of a homegrown system uh, that was a modified version of the National Dysphagia Diet. And what was specific to us that we were finding with the National Dysphagia Diet was that a lot of it was subjective. And so they had the pureed foods, and then we had um, the, the level two with the modifications. But with pediatrics, we were noticing that um, we were frequently having to work with our physicians who were putting orders while patients were inpatient to say, oh, well, yeah, we're going to do this level of a diet, but we need you to put in, you know, these transitional solids so they can continue to work on their chewing. Or we need you to make sure that the purees look like this and um, they aren't having any of, you know, they're not as sticky. Or we were having problems where uh, the baby foods weren't as consistent as um, what the kitchen was sending up. And so we just found that it wasn't working and that we were constantly creating an individual diet for each patient, which may be great, but it was horrible for the kitchen. Uh, for liquids specifically, it was kind of a, a area we really wanted to tackle because we had a lot of infants that were coming through our teens and working with our uh, different uh, physician groups and we were constantly struggling with giving them the right thing. And what we knew from the research that we um, had uh, investigated in with our teams is that um, what we were giving during a modified barium swallow study didn't always 100% relate to what we were then recommending patients get at each feed. And we knew from, you know, Glasper and Dean that, you know, a lot of times speech language pathologists um, thought that they were, um, able to judge what thickness the liquid was, but actually we were really bad at it. We also were having problems figuring out what to thicken with. And so when we looked at everything we were trying to do, we reached out to um, Bucky Chambers and Garcia, and specifically um, Dr. Garcia after one of her ASHA presentations, because they were using a modified version of the Lions Bart test. And so what we tried to do was take all the information we knew about what thickeners you used and the formulas and create um, the beginnings of a recipe and then use a modified line spread test to look and see, okay, are we close? Are we making the right consistency for this infant? And we were trying to teach parents how to use it. We ran into a lot of problems though. And 
most of the problems we ran into is that it's not the modified land spread test wasn't able to be used on the floors because of infection control that it was kind of expensive and cumbersome to use for each feed that parents were struggling figuring out well does this really make is this really working and as you can see from the picture there there were times where liquid leaked out and then solids were spreading funny and it just ended up that it wasn't as useful as we really had wanted it to be at the time And so um, through a lot of um, my work trying to get my BCS and going to ASHA and working with other clinicians, I got introduced to the research that was coming out about the IBDSI. And before it was even released, what was really great is that we were able to use what the IBDSI was looking into, why they wanted to do what they did, and all their research, and provide it to a lot of our clinician and physician teams and this was a kind of an aha moment for a lot of our physicians where the way that the IDDSI group wrote their information really hit home and for the first time for some of our physicians they really understood what we were trying to do and why we were trying to do it and um, specifically one of my favorite GI colleagues was telling me that the way this was written and how they linked how they're modifying the diets why it's important to be done a specific way and how they related it to the swallow dysfunction and what we're looking to do really made sense for me so it really helped us to get some backing from our physician colleagues before we were even close to being able to try and roll it out. So since I started working at Connecticut Children's, I had been complaining to Marnie about our use of, the, our modified use of the National Dysphagia Diet. Um, and she had told me after a while about, when she had heard about the IDDSI, she had shared that information with me and I was so excited about it. Unfortunately, at that time it was not out yet, but um, the day it did come out, I received a message from Marnie telling me that it was out, and by the time I got back to my desk, I had a printed framework on my desk ready for me to read through. So Marnie and I got really excited about this, mostly because of a lot of the new um, things and um, things that the IDDSI incorporated that other dysphagia diets didn't, um, and they really took into account pediatrics, which made us really excited. So a few things that we were excited about were the use of slightly thick um, or half-strength nectars. They incorporated transitional solids or meltable solids, which we use um, for our younger kiddos when it's developmentally appropriate, and easy, reliable testing methods that we could do at bedside and easily teach caregivers. And they took into account pediatric norms for particle and bite sizes. So Marnie and I read through this and we knew it was something that we really wanted to do for our facility um, and we knew we needed to kind of jump on the train. So we brought it to our manager, Jenny, Virginia, and um, we were hoping to get her approval and we did. She was very supportive of what we wanted to do. Um, and after we did that, we really started reading through the materials to try to figure out what we needed to start uh, as soon as we possibly could. So at this point, I think it's pretty important to um, kind of discuss that we started this so super early um, that a lot of the information was available, but unfortunately when you start something so early because you're so excited, you can put the cart before the horse. So uh, there was no wonderful videos by the IDDSI. There weren't a lot of the handouts. And so we actually had to do a lot of beta testing of actually how do we implement this syringe test based on the written directions and how do we not that it, the directions were very clear but we wanted to figure out how we did it before we tried to implement it in any way we also went back to all the solids and figured out well how do we actually you know look at what we're making and alter some of these diets and put it together and that led to um Virginia coming to us and saying, okay, well, we have all this stuff in place as far as how we're doing the thick and liquids and we had these baseline recipes started and, you know, she wanted to make sure that if we're going to move ahead with something, do we have some kind of correlation? So we did start with some of the basic stuff of looking at what we were doing with the line spread test and comparing it directly to what came out on the IDDSI flow test. And we were finding it was easier, <laughs> um, more efficient, we weren't so wasteful, infectious control was going to be more happy about it because we were using more sterile products and it could be done at bedside. We did find that when we were um, using some um, 
compositions for thick and liquid that had um, rice cereal or uh, another uh, cereal base that it didn't flow through as well for the for flow it, test. With natural thickeners. Um, but I think that also goes to the composition of liquid and what would happen with the bottle. So we were okay with it. So once we had all that information and we had Virginia's approval and support, um, we knew that we needed to get our department and our other clinicians on board as well. So we taught all of our clinicians the flow test. Um, and we also taught them how to use the new testing methods for solids. We also shared um, the guideline bank of recipes that we made so that anytime they see a patient, they kind of had a place to start and they could create a recipe from there. So um, in terms of gaining organizational support, for the department piece of things with what was brought to me, it was very clear that from both uh, quality and a, an efficiency standpoint that the IDDSI was the way to go, but also realized that there was going to be the need to get support across the organization from the many other departments that we would need to work with to make this uh, a reality. And so, you know, that involved our nutrition department, our kitchen department, our IT department to change our medical records around, um, and, you know, various other players that were involved in the process, and, and really the leadership above all of those departments as well, even down to finance, because we were needing to change how we ordered some of our supplies. So um, all of that was definitely um, work that needs to be considered, but to give kudos to our organization, it was something that people wrapped their arms around pretty quickly. They understood the quality and efficiency pieces to it um, and worked readily with us to make it happen. And I think that one of the things that's important to note is that the um, the research base was there, which definitely spoke to people, and an endorsement from agencies such as the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, and you know, it really also spoke to leadership that in addition to the focus on quality and efficiency, there were parent um, and staff testimonials anecdotally about the benefit to patients. And after we received all that support, we wanted to get going with using the IDDSI standards for our thickening and diet modifications. And the first thing that we did was gathered everything for the flow test. It was one of the first things that we were introduced to and that we introduced to our staff. So we need to get the 10 ml slip tip syringe. Um, so when we thought we were ahead of the game, we ordered 10 ml slip tip syringes, tested all of our formula recipes, and even had the syringes stocked on the floors. Um, and then we found out that we should have checked for updates because there had to be a specific barrel length. And so we had to go back and find the correct syringe, take them off of the floors, restock them when we had the correct <laughs> syringe, and make sure that all of our recipes that we had done in the beta testing still worked. Um, and once we obtained the correct syringe, which is actually pictured above there, um, we were seeing that our recipes were not accurate, so we had to go back to the starting board. And even though we thought that having the flow test at the bedside would increase the patient's likeliness of consuming the correct consistency, consistency constantly, we saw that there were also some difficulties with the different methods of mixing the formula with thickener. Um, we tried fork whisking, blending, shaking, and even using a formula mixer. And um, we're currently trying to use something called an arrow latte, which is also pictured up there, to try to make the way that we thicken more consistent. There have been some growing pains. Um, it's difficult sometimes to teach people how to use them, um, especially on the inpatient side. Although what we've seen is it's beneficial to use a blender because it makes it easier and it completely dissolves all the thickener. For sanitary and infection control reasons, um, we are not allowed to use blenders on the inpatient side, um, which is why we're trying a bunch of different methods, such as fork whisking and using the Aero Latte. Another item that we needed for our diets to be consistent was a knife or a chopping method that made bite sizes consistent and the correct size. And although the kitchen was trying to just do some knife skills and chopping them, um, we saw that it wasn't always consistent. So we went through ricers, egg slicers, meat slicers, and vegetable slicers, and even a grater. 
And we recently began using a chopper that had multiple grids. And that has been shown in our test trays that we've been doing, which we'll talk about later, to be very beneficial. So after we obtained the appropriate syringe, um, we started implementing the flow test immediately to our inpatients and outpatients. So to do this, we provided flow test instructions and hands-on education to caregivers. Um, the pictures you see on our slide, you can find on the IBDSI website, and they are extremely helpful when you're teaching a caregiver, um, just as a reference point and to give them something else to bring home um, to kind of go back to. We also, for our inpatients, we added their thickened liquid recipe and the flow test instructions to the feeding plans that we hang at bedside. And we also put the instructions of the flow test and the recipe in the medical chart so that it's easily accessible to our medical staff. And although it was very clear before with um, just the printed instructions, I will tell you from nursing and a lot of the families, um, across where we are inpatient, oftentimes people prefer the photographics. I don't know why, but um, we just wanted to give kudos because that was a great addition um, to the materials available. Absolutely. And speaking of nurses, we actually provided a lot of education to our nursing staff. Um, when we were doing the rollout, we realized that we had to have, a, to have a more aggressive way to get the RNs engaged because they're the last people who see the formula before the patient is given it. Um, so we brought the learning process right to them. We went in their staff lounges and showed them the video of how to do these flow tests. Um, had them do some hands-on testing and training with actually doing the flow test and then asked them a few questions whether they thought it was beneficial, um, if they thought it was easy to see how they understood the test and if they would be able to pass that on to family members. And as you can see from the picture up there, the graph, um, about 63.64% of the RN surveyed strongly agreed that it was useful to confirm consistencies. And just to add to that, before we showed them how to, we showed them the video of doing the flow test, we actually had some thickened liquids um, right there for them to look at and try to guess the consistency of. And it was nice for them to see that it was pretty hard to actually guess what the consistency of the liquids was by just looking at it. Um, and one of our other data points was actually if they felt comfortable teaching the flow test to caregivers or patients after just our hands-on training. Um, and a majority of them strongly agreed with that. Despite that, we knew that we weren't going to be able to reach all nurses and all medical staff um, who might be preparing liquids, thickened liquids for our patients. So we also made an online learning module that they all have to do annually. And this was one of my favorite aha moments when you get one of those really senior nurses and you show them the liquid and they're like, oh, this is thin and they test it and it's actually a slightly thick or they're like, oh, this is a nectar and it's actually a honey um, or a mildly or moderately thick. Um, we're still working on transitioning fully over to the IVDSI liquid um, uh, labels. So we tend to still intermix them. Apologize for that. And that's something we'll talk about a little later. So we have a bunch of pictures on this slide. So like Jody pre previously mentioned, um, we've experimented with using different things to thicken on our inpatient floors. In our outpatient settings, we do use blenders to thicken. Um, and on the right side of the slide, you actually see two graphics. So we knew that, I mean, we've known that things are not being consistently thickened on our inpatient floors, and these two pictures kind of show you that. So the top picture on the right-hand side is actually five different bottles that were all prepared for the same patient that we found in one of our fridges. And when we took them all out and tested each one, they all came out to different, um, different remaining MLs on the flow test. Um, we're not sure who prepared these bottles, if it was the same caregiver or multiple different caregivers, um, but it definitely shows you that we're not consistently thickening. And the picture right below that is an, it shows you the difficulty we have with actually thickening on our floors. So just we're not sure how this was thickened either, but whether it was just kind of the thickener was dumped into the bottle and, and shaken, or if they tried to whisk it, or if it just kind of all settled, we're not really sure. Um, but this is something we're still working on. Hopefully the use of the Aero Latte will help with that. And this is one of our uh, little 
kind of Achilles heels when it comes to things. We'll, they'll, we'll get a page at four o'clock on a Friday. Oh, it, you know, it's not coming out right. I tested, I tested, I don't understand why. And even though we include things like the temperature that you need to serve the liquid at to make sure that it would meet um, the criteria on the flow test or exactly what you're looking for, a lot of times we'll come and we'll say, oh, well, it isn't warmed yet, that's why. And you have to wait till it's warmed if you read the directions or, oh, you warmed it too much and didn't let it sit or you didn't wait the five minutes because by the time I got here, now it is, you know, the right consistency. So sometimes it's just an education of some of those factors as well. In, in terms of technical support, I mentioned earlier that we had to engage our IT department to help because it did also involve changing some aspects of our medical record. The diet order sets um, and the um, terminology. So you can see there the um, in the red box, dysphagia diet puree and what follows there. Uh, those were modifications that were made. And then in addition to that, we made a procedural choice to have the therapists be the ones to actually order the diet. So to pend up the order for the physician's signature as opposed to just writing the suggestion of an, um, into the chart note as to what the physician should order. We did that for uh, efficiency sake, but also for accuracy sake, figuring it would be very difficult to try to communicate that to the physician and have the order end up the way that we wanted it. We are also very lucky that Virginia went to bat for us to get us to be able to pend the orders um, because despite our education efforts and putting all of the recipes and the diets in the chart and everywhere else we could put it, we were still noticing um, and we were still noticing that the wrong diets were being ordered. Um, Part of this also is because we have, we are a teaching hospital, and so we have residents who rotate in so quickly. As soon as we have <laughs> educated one group of residents, the next one comes in and needs all re-education, and so we were battling with having to basically go and sit and re-educate, which is great because we feel like we're helping the ITZY group with learning about um, their wonderful um, implementation <laughs> and diets, but at the same time, there's only so many hours in the day. And within the diet orders that you see there, so what we actually do is pick one of those and then another box pops up that lets us choose the liquid consistency. Um, and one of the things, the liquid consistency, I, this was a, a back and forth between me and one of the assistant dietitian managers for quite a while because we really wanted everything to fall under the dysphagia diet set, but because with infants there were so many different special formulas and different ways that they prepared in the formula room, it, all the formulas still really did have to fall under that formula category, and then we have a specific drop down that then lets the mm -hmm. physician or us, whoever's pending, be able to select the appropriate thickness. And just quickly to note there, Marnie mentioned before, but you'll see putting honey nectar um, with arrows there. Uh, we had worked with the IDDSI to be able to modify their graphics so that it would help uh, to transition our staff in understanding what the previous label had been to what the new label is. So like we had mentioned before, um, when we first initiated our transition to the IDDSI, Marnie and I had taken some foods from our kitchen um, home and we started developing some recipes to hopefully um, help with the transition that our menus were going to go through to meet the new IDDSI criteria. So the picture you can see here are um, some examples of some of the recipes that we came up with. We were pretty excited about these recipes. We kind of thought we, we were really jumping the gun and we had a really good start. Um, so when we brought these to our dietitians and to the rest of the team, we were kind of blindsided when they suddenly were asking a lot of questions about how we prepared these recipes. So our dietitians are really great and they wanted really specific information so that we could make sure that anyone who was preparing these solid recipes was doing it exactly the same way. But in some ways, it was things we never, ever thought about, like exactly how many pulses or how many seconds did you blend it for, or exactly, because we were like, okay, we've got the liquid down, we've got the actual how hot it was or what happened, but some of the questions were pretty interesting because I never would have thought to be like that specific about it. Or how many times did you stop and stir? Did you add the water first? Yeah, very specific things that just were not on our radar. 
It was a learning process for everybody involved. <laughs> So Marnie and I took more food from the kitchen and went back home with it and started testing it again. So you can see some examples here of how we tried to get a little bit more specific to help um, the rest of the people and the rest of the disciplines who were helping us throughout this process. Um, but when we brought this back to our dietitians and the rest of the team, they had even more questions for us that we definitely weren't anticipating. So you see in some recipes, there's a recipe for meatballs. Um, and we actually added some water to make it a smooth puree. And our dietitians had concerns that adding water had no nutritional value or adding other condiments like ketchup and barbecue sauce might have too much sodium or too much sugar. And this is sometimes where the battle between as a speech language pathologist trying to make food appealing and welcoming for some of the children who are already probably not thrilled about being on modified diets versus, you know, the dietitians were like, we really want these kids to be healthy and get the right things and we have this wonderful health initiative, sometimes came to a head. So when we did this, we actually went back into the kitchen with um, a bunch of people, so kitchen staff um, and dietitians, and we all tried to create these recipes together, but we realized with our upcoming rollout update that it might be too much of a process right then to put all these menus into place. Um, we also, when we did this, when we all went into the kitchen together, we started hearing some concerns from the kitchen about space. Our kitchen is very small, so we just don't really have the space to store a lot of foods. And since we were using um, large industrial equipment to make these recipes, we couldn't really just make one at a time. We had to make larger batches. So because we did have an upcoming rollout date and we knew we needed to get some things on the menus, we decided to trial some pre-made um, and pre-packaged puree products. So we ordered some and we tested it all together. So you actually see a picture of what a uh, pre-made corn. Um, and we decided to add some of those to our menus when we rolled out. This really helped us since we have limited um, storage space and we could kind of start by putting some of these items on our menus and then hopefully creating more recipes from there. Unfortunately, you can see this is actually a picture of one of our um, minced and moist lunch and dinner menus that about 50% of this menu is actually pre-made puree products. Um, so they're not homemade recipes and they're also over restricting a patient who would typically be on a minced and moist diet and is now getting a majority of puree items. So this definitely isn't our goal. It's something that we're continuing to work on. Um, and it definitely takes a lot of collaboration with all disciplines. And as much as we loved inter-collaboration and discipline, part of what happens when we talk about the pressures of rollout are things like the dietitians are on specific timelines for menus and have certain things that they have to get done. And so sometimes even though we were trying to advocate for one way, they were trying to advocate to make sure that everything could be out in the timeline that needed to be done. And we have to say we've had such good collaboration with the other disciplines who've been involved in our team to make this happen. But it is difficult sometimes with everyone having different projects going on and different deadlines. So after we went live with all these diet changes, we knew we still had a lot of work to do. So one way that we were checking to make sure that our dysphagia diets were meeting the IDDSI criteria was by doing test trays. And what we mean by that is that we ordered a tray from the kitchen saying that it was for a speech eval. Um, we indicated when we would pick it up and what we needed on the tray, and then we would test it using the IDBSI testing methods. And we kept documentation on whether the tray passed or failed, and what we came to find initially was that a lot of them were failing. I mean, as you can see from our data that we've collected so far, is that the most difficult was the minced and moist. And with a lot of this, when we were doing it, we purposely used everything as a speech evaluation tray, and some of them were truly being used in evaluations, and some of them were just for the purpose of seeing where we were. We also were really fortunate because Virginia uh, worked with the whole team, and we got together, and we were having IDDSI meetings, so we were able to come back and say, hey, you know, within our evaluation trays this month, this many had this, and this wasn't passing, or this is what we saw, and we had some photos and things to go along with it. So it was a way to help keep us all on the same page on what we were trying to accomplish. Which we're going to show you some photos next. And another thing I will mention is that these photos are all older from when we first implemented the IDDSI. 
Um, and something else that we also have since implemented to help more of our trays pass or meet passing criteria is the use of time trays. So we did find that with some of the pre-made um, puree products, they once they were kind of room temperature or got really cold, they just did not pass using IVDSI testing um, methods. So that is something that was concerning to us. So we now have time trays where if a patient is on a puree or minced and moist diet, that once the tray is finished, it has to go up to the patient's room within 10 to 15 minutes. So here you can see a couple pictures of some previous test trays. Um, these are pretty awful ones, which we thought would be a good way to show you guys. Um, so on the left, we have an example of a puree tray. So all the way in the left, you can see homemade pureed meatballs, which did not pass because they have excess liquid and they're very lumpy. And then we have two pre-made puree products, um, which also did not pass because this tray had been sitting out for a while. In the middle, you see a, a minced and moist tray. Um, pretty much on all of these, you can, you can see inconsistent bite and cut sizes here. So um, on the top left, you have some penne pasta, which is very inconsistent. Um, and no moisture is added to that. The bottom is chicken with no moisture. And the right hand side is homemade macaroni and cheese, which has awesome moisture, but they did not make any attempts to cut um, down the pasta pieces. On the right hand side, um, there's an example of our soft diet. So again, you're seeing the inconsistency in the, in the bite sizes, which has um, been probably our largest problem to overcome on our test trays. But we have seen an, an increase in better results from our test trays with the new chopping methods like the grids. Well, the kitchen does mm -hmm. hate doing pasta with the grids <laughs> because they say it sticks and it's horrible to clean. So we're, we're still negotiating. And we're constantly kind of talking back and forth with our kitchen and they're giving us updates about, hey, we tried this grid or we tried this chopping thing and everything's getting stuck or it's not working. Um, so we're constantly looking for new ideas. So future plans, so we kind of talked about how our menus are very restrictive currently. Um, that's not ideal for us. We really want our menus to be appealing to our pediatric patients and we would prefer to have more homemade items. So that's gonna be something that we work for ongoing. And anybody who saw the chalk presentation at the Children's Hospital of Orange County, they had so many good things and they have a cookbook and I suggest anybody who's in pediatrics and trying to roll out or anybody who wants some additional ideas, take a peek at that because one of the things that we are continuing to work with our dietitians about are what we can possibly transition to as far as they use quinoa. Uh, we don't have quinoa on our menu, but it definitely would make uh, doing certain things that are minced and moist versus trying to chop these noodles, which are a headache for all involved, be a little bit more effective and efficient or using different noodle sizes. So these are all things that we definitely are looking into and love the fact that everybody else as they present are offering different options and suggestions that we can reach out and connect with. We've also um, considered and looked into the use of possibly using like food molds um, to make it more appealing on trays. But again, with our lack of storage in our kitchen, that hasn't been something that's been able to happen yet, um, but we're still hopeful for the future. We would like to create a better protocol for thickening liquids on the floors. Um, so you guys saw the pictures that we showed about thickening on the floors and um, we're hoping to find a method that's consistent and can be used for every inpatient. And our most recent attempts um, are the, is the introduction of the arrow latte, which was discussed before, but longer range plans involve the potential um, as we expand for having instead of one formula room in the hospital, multiple formula rooms per floor and uh, milk room and milk techs actually to uh, potentially help with that. And to clarify too, because I think we missed this before, currently, um, formula is then up to the floor kitchens and the caregiver for that patient. So typically the nurse has to thicken and then they bring it to the room and we ask that the caregiver or whoever's um, feeding the patient is actually, that's the person who's doing the flow test before the patient eats. So because of that, there's kind of a lot of unknowns. So we do want to have ongoing quality assessments. So we're going to continue our test trays, but as far as, um, our liquids on the floors and making sure that they're consistently thickened. We do have plans to start um, keeping data um, by hanging some sheets um, at bedside. So 
really we're just going to ask whoever does the flow test before each feed to document how many mls was were remaining on the flow test so we can see um, if liquids are consistently being thickened for our patients we're also going to start the use of the audit sheets from the IDDSI website um, to help our kitchen staff. If you have not already seen those, um, they're extremely helpful and we're really excited to start using those. They're really quick sheets that the kitchen staff can kind of look, look through and I think they're checkoff boxes, right? So, um, so they can help kind of go through each tray and make sure that it meets criteria for the IDDSI diet that the patient is on. Um, we do plan to continue to work towards getting um, everybody on board with using um, the IDDS I labels for all of our diet consistencies, including liquids and getting rid of the old terminology. Additionally, I really, really appreciate the color coding materials that co correlate with the diet textures. And we are looking to post, uh, work towards getting um, a lot of our posting and signage at bedside regarding to restrictive diets uh, to use that so it's more clear to everybody in there that there is a special diet. Um, the other thing, I don't know how, who else is really geeky and loves to read all the stuff that the, um, the, the group from the ITSI um, uh, puts out, but I know um, Ben Hansen had written something and he was advocating for ITSI. And one of the things that had come out and that he was talking about was when you're using a more consistent diet, then especially in a place like where we're only doing pediatric work and the literature is not as enriched with some of the information that we would like, that we can start to kind of do our own types of research, not just qualitative information, because we are using a more consistent um, diets with uh, more consistent diets with all of our patients. And just to piggyback on the continuing advocacy for our patients, again, one of the biggest reasons we started this project and the transition to the IDDSI so soon was because we were so excited about what it could do for our patients. Um, and so we've definitely had some growing pains, and I think <laughs> there's probably more somewhere down the road, but we are happy with our progress so far. Um, and we're so thankful that the IDDSI has provided so many great materials that are, that's really just helping our organization. And everybody along the organization truly appreciates that there is a way to test what we're doing because up until now, everything was so subjective. Even the PCAs are getting on board with it and they're like, hey, I looked at this tray and I'm pretty sure this isn't right. So the more people are learning and the more we're growing with it, the more consistency and reliability we're getting with our implementation. So the next slide shows how you can reach us um, to connect you directly to our website and then you could find our, um, our information, um, our emails and also information about our programs there. But in the meantime, let's turn to the Q&A to see what questions you have for us right now. So we have a question from Mary that says, how did the dietitians respond and food services? Initially, I will say uh, the dietitians thought we were nuts because we really did immediately were like, this is what we've been waiting for um, because I, I kind of stopped Dr. Steele and um, Peter Lamb and everybody else because I was so excited about it. Every um, presentation at ASHA or any of the DRS stuff I could see, I definitely wanted um, something better. And so since we were a little bit earlier on the bandwagon, um, what had happened is a lot of our dietitians were like, but, you know, the Dietetic Association here does not support this, and I don't understand. So we did have a lot of pushback initially, but as soon as AND um, went ahead and, you know, endorsed the change, we had a lot more of our dietitians start to jump on board, start to do a lot of their own initial reading and connect with other dietitians out there. So... Um, as far as food service, go ahead, Kim. So as far as food service, um, I think they initially also thought we were a little bit crazy just because of the scope of this project. Um, and I think they were accepting to the changes, definitely, but they wanted to know how we were going to do it and what we needed to change and what the timeline to that was. So we were very lucky to have um, some great collaboration with the kitchen manager. Um, and some key players in the kitchen who really kind of helped us move this project along. Um, specifically one, Stella, yes. she's, uh, is she the kitchen manager? No, no, but um, she, she has done so much research into all this. And actually, um, a lot of the actual food prep staff and kitchen staff 
sat down with me and looked at a video swallow and really took the time to try and understand why on earth are we even trying to do this. And that was a really nice experience for me, mm -hmm. um, helping other people who are really interested in learning why on earth do they have to do this and why are we doing it in the first place. We also have a question from Holly. Will you be sharing the slide deck? I'm going to um, answer that in two parts. One is to say, I believe I'm going to defer to the IDDSI folks because I believe that it's going to be available to rewatch on their website. So there'll be a, a link to it up there. But uh, secondarily, if you wanted to get in contact with us, we'd be happy to share it with you. Yes, Ginny, thank you. Um, if we, as I, as I mentioned uh, before you started your uh, presentation, we will be sharing the recording of this webinar through our website, iddsi.org, and also on our YouTube channel. Uh, but if um, Ginny and her team would like to share this with us, we will also make the presentation available directly on our website. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. It looks like we have another question from Laura from Argentina. She's asking, did we test powder infant formula at different concentrations and with the addition of contrast powder as used in dynamic swallowing studies? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I can't even tell you how many, I mean, our dietitians, this is where they were really helpful and getting very sick of us. I was like, hang on, I forgot, you know, can you send me the recipe for this concentration of this formula again? And to tell you the truth, almost every formula, regardless of concentration, came out as a thick liquid with the exception of the ones that are added rice starch. And what was interesting even about those is that Similac, um, their product uh, doesn't thicken or um, test exactly the same way as the Infamil added rice starch one. And that just went to show us that um, in different um, concentrations of those definitely have their own restrictions on them as well. So make sure you're looking at that. Um, but when we went to test them all, it just came down to, we need to make sure we're, you know, putting that modifier of the temperature and also of the um, concentration in there. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. Marty and I also had tested uh, ready to use formulas versus powder formulas as well, just to see if they came out consistently with each other. Um, as far as the swallow study, um, we were doing barium. We actually attempt to avoid adding formula to our barium products if possible. And we do use, um, I'm not allowed to say the bear bar products because that's what we use, I'm sorry. Um, we do use certain products uh, to do it um, and we are trying to maintain some level of consistency with what we um, present. Um, with that being said, how we found out we were using the wrong syringes is because we were testing barium and we tried to compare it to what it's even doing and putting out and went through a bunch of emails. That's how we realized we were using the incorrect syringes. Uh, Mary is asking a question. Can you review the pieces of equipment that are most helpful and what is the Aero Latte? I'm going to answer the second part of that question and then I'll let somebody else take the first part. The Aero Latte, um, going back to one of the earlier slides when Jody was showing the equipment, the same slide that had the, ch um, the different blades for the chopper on it. The Aero Latte is basically a handheld blender, um, cross between a whisk and a blender that can be used at the bedside. So what we've started very recently doing, so it's really still a pilot, um, is handing those out per inpatient um, as a patient specific item that's dispensed to them. So it doesn't need to be taken to any other rooms or cleaned off the floor. And the cleaning instructions for it are to um, run it under uh, warm running water or put hot water in a cup and turn it on and um, clean it that way. So it doesn't require cleaning um, that would need a dishwasher or need to need a sterilizer or anything like that. So um, it was approved by our infection control. And at this point in time, seems to be pretty effective for getting the liquids blended with the caveat that it does tend to give it a little bit of a foaming um, consistency because it is designed to be something that you would use to make a head on your cappuccino, basically. 
So some of the other um, pieces of equipment that we use, so in our outpatient settings, we typically always use a blender um, to blend thickened liquids, which we do find easiest um, just to make sure that everything is consistently um, thickened with no clumps. We also do in our outpatient kitchens have um, whisks that we found very helpful as well. Um, so those are our preferred methods of thickening outpatient. Uh, we have a question coming in asking, um, I was curious about why the level four is the same for the solid and liquid food. Do they have exactly the same consistency? If so, why are they given two names? I'm going to defer to the IDDSI folks on this. Sure. Uh, uh, go ahead, Jen. Okay. Um, so, um, well, I think the re the, basically the reason why is because Conceptually, we tend to think of um, things as a food and a, and a liquid, and that tends to be how, um, how in, certainly in hospital systems, how there will be an order for that. And, um, I, and I think for most people, they think of things as a food and a liquid. The characteristics of the level four, the puree, and the extremely thick, they behave in the same manner. So essentially the testing methods that you use and the reasons why, some of the reasons why you might offer that to someone um, from a physiological perspective may be similar. So that was the reason why they are, and they are linked across. And you might note that level three also is linked across for sort of the, a similar reason because we like to think about things as a food and a liquid or a fluid um, or a drink. And, um, and so we do put that out there as having two sort of separate things, even though the characteristics or behavior of those different food or drink products are gonna be similar. Thank you, Jan. Okay. I'll hand it back to you guys. Okay, I see a comment from Laura just saying thank you and that she's working right now to implement IDDSI at her hospital, so that's great. And again, if you see our information there, please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you need any help along the way. We'd be happy to confer with you. Yeah. And looking at all the people who are starting to do this and the information that's going up on on the ITSE website and all the different people who are starting to comment and get linked, I think um, ITSE is also helping to put us all together as well. So I know that that's a wonderful resource to go back to as you're starting the implementation. Not to mention, again, when you get so excited about something, you sometimes miss out on all the benefit that comes after. So it doesn't look like we have any other questions populating. Um, okay. I want to take a minute just to say to thank all the participants tonight, but also to thank the IDDSI for working with us along this journey and being such a helpful resource to getting where we need to be. Well, thank you, folks. Uh, this has been incredibly informative and uh, very enjoyable. Um, I do want to add on to the previous question, uh, to the previous comment from Laura uh, regarding implementation in Argentina. Uh, on our website, if you visit our website, iddsi.org, uh, on the resources page, uh, you will probably find a lot of information that will hopefully be useful um, in your process of implementation. We are constantly uploading new documents and reviewing those documents, so please um, do refer to those documents. They're there uh, for public use. Uh, there's, um, um, yeah, there's, there's just a bunch of links up there that I'm sure will be useful for anyone uh, that is working in implementation. It does look like there might be one more question. Oh, there's a oh. question from... Susan, well, she, she's saying thanks so much. She's new to dysphagia and excited to incorporate. So more of a comment, but thank you, Susan. And good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck. And I think the one other thing that I would like to add is that we have um, also worked with IDDSI to put together a video that in fairly short time should be posted up on their website as well if people want to take a look at that because it will help to round out the story. We've told you a lot from the perspective of an SLP and tried to incorporate our version of the other disciplines 
um, participation in this, but the video will highlight, it does it have segments from each of those players in terms of what their experience was like for the process. And I think most importantly, there is a parent segment that talks about the experience for the parent and the child. And um, I think looking at all of those holistically was also really important in terms of gaining overall organizational support for the for the diet implementation. And for anybody out there who's newer to the process, I will tell you, I have multiple times just emailed people at AC and been like, can you answer this or can you do this? And everybody is so welcoming and supportive and they will connect you with somebody else who in your area or in a similar situation to link up and be able to collaborate with. So they are such a welcoming, open group and they believe in what they do and it's such a good thing that they're rolling out for us that um, I would encourage anybody to reach right out to them as well. Okay, well on that lovely comment, <laughs> uh, we are going to end this webinar. Uh, just again, a reminder that a recording of it will be available on our website, uh, most likely by the end of the week, um, as long, uh, along with the video that uh, Virginia just introduced. So you're, you'll have a very holistic experience of, of their process uh, of implementing the IDDSI. Um, and if you know of anyone who would benefit uh, from watching uh, this webinar and the video, uh, please share this information with them. I would like to thank again Virginia, Cami, Jody, and Marnie from the Connecticut Children's Medical Center uh, for your dedication to the implementation and your very informative presentations back in May 9th and today. So thank you very much uh, for your help. And thank you again to Peter Lamb and Jen Duestein from the IDDSI Board of Directors. And especially thank you to all the listeners for joining us this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are. We hope that you found this information very useful in your practice and in your process of implementation of the IDDSI. Uh, and with this, we'll be signing off. We hope you have a great rest of your day or your evening. And until next time.